This is Justice, History, and the Law. Lectures, discussions, and interviews from the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. On today's show, we have more from the International Humanitarian Law Dialogues at the Chautauqua Institution. Today is a keynote speech by Professor William Shabbos. He is introduced by Richard Goldstone. Richard Goldstone, as we know, is from South Africa, has received a BA and an LLB from the University of Witwatersrand. I probably blew that one. And he went on to earn a degree as an advocate at the Johannesburg Bar. He eventually rose to the judge of the appellate division of the Supreme Court and later a justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. We knew he served as the chairperson of the Goldstone Commission, or what was formerly titled the Commission of Inquiry Regarding Public Violence and Intimidation. After the commission, he became the chief prosecutor of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. He helped to draft the Declaration of Human Duties and Responsibilities for the Director General of UNESCO, or the Valencia Declaration. He became the chairperson of the Bradlow Foundation, a charitable educational trust, and also the head of the Board of Human Rights Institute of South Africa. He has numerous honorary degrees, and it goes on and on and on. But what's most important, when I had a chance to talk to Richard Goldstone, who in my eyes is way up here, I asked the question, and he's going to share with it, what does Robert Jackson mean to a Richard Goldstone? So if I could call Richard, come up. Well, good afternoon. Thanks, Greg. I hope there, there are a few of you in the room who know the story, so I apologise in advance for having to retell it and putting you through what my wife goes through every day, uh, hearing the same story more than once. But, but the, the story really relates to a few days in, the, in, in, in June of 1994. I had, as Greg mentioned, been involved in what came, became known as the Goldstone Commission. It was a three-year inquiry into the violence in South Africa, and it was a very difficult, difficult commission. We had 40 uh, uh, discrete investigations, and at the end of it, 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 it ended just before our first democratic election, uh, as a result of which Nelson Mandela became our first democratically elected president. And when I got back from a holiday, a well-earned holiday in Italy, um, I went into my office in, the, uh, in our then uh, uh, Supreme Court of Appeal, and I was informed by President Mandela uh, that it had been decided that I would be invited to be one of the first 11 justices on our new constitutional court, which was being set up under the new constitution. And of course, that was the greatest ambition that any South African lawyer could, could, could dream of, and I was, I was over the moon with, 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 with excitement. The same day, I got a, a fax from, uh, from Judge Antonio Cassese, who was the first president of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the RCTY, asking me if I was interested in becoming the chief prosecutor. The reason for that goes back nine months before, because the, the, the tribunal was, was established in, in May of 1993. The judges were appointed in September, October, 11 judges originally from 11 different countries, and the Security Council decided that it would appoint the chief prosecutor on the nomination of the Secretary General, who was then Butchus Butchus Ghali. And they decided, too, that the appointment would be made by consensus effectively having 15 vetoes, not five. They decided in October unanimously to appoint the Venezuelan Attorney General, Escobar Salom, as the Chief Prosecutor. He was appointed. He informed Butuscali, however, that he wasn't available until January because he was busy prosecuting a former president of Venezuela for fraud. January, well, Butuscali said, we've got no option, we'll wait for you. Comes to January and Escobar Salom arrives in The Hague, and after three days, he calls Butrus Gardi and says, I'm, I'm now resigning as Chief Prosecutor to become the Deputy Prime Minister of Venezuela. 
So January, some eight months after the tribunal was established, there's no prosecutor. The judges were beside themselves with anguish because without a prosecutor there was no work being, being done for them. There was like running a restaurant with no chef. And uh, between January and June of 1994, the Security Council vetoed eight nominees of the Secretary General. Five were vetoed by Russia, presumably because they came from NATO countries. The United Kingdom vetoed an American on the ground that he was a Muslim and they thought that it's not a good idea knowing that the Bosniaks are mostly Muslim victims in Bosnia. It's not a good idea to, to, to aggravate Serbia even more by having a Muslim prosecutor. Uh, he's known to many of us in this room. Uh, in, in return, when, when somebody from Scotland was nominated, Pakistan, who was a non-permanent member, vetoed to retaliate against the United Kingdom for vetoing um, a, a Muslim. And uh, the, the Attorney General of India, was uh, Sadi Surabji, was also vetoed by Pakistan. This is now June of 1994, 13 months after the tribunal is set up, there's no prosecutor. And you can imagine the effect on victims in the former Yugoslavia. And the judges had decided informally, I found out later, they decided that they were going to resign en masse if there was no prosecutor by July of that year. Cassese was at a human rights conference in Paris and a French judge, Roger Herrera, uh, suggested to him that the way out was to get somebody from South Africa who would have Nelson Mandela's stamp of approval. He said nobody in July 1994 would dream of vetoing anybody supported by Mandela. And Cassese thought that was a good idea. I'd been involved with this investigation and I get a, uh, this invitation from Cassese asking if I'm interested in becoming chief prosecutor. I'd barely read it with amusement because it was, to me, an amusing invitation for reasons I'll mention. My telephone rings and it's my wife. She said, any interesting mail? And I said, not particularly, but I said, I've got quite an unusual, ridiculous invitation to become a chief prosecutor of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. She doesn't ask me any questions except to say, she said, wouldn't that be great to go and live in uh, Europe for a few years? So I said, well, it's not as simple as that. I said, there are three reasons why I'm not the appropriate person. Firstly, I'd never prosecuted in my life. Secondly, I knew nothing about international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict. I knew nothing about it. And thirdly, I knew next to nothing about the former Yugoslavia. Each one of those reasons was a disqualification. And, I was, and, and she, she understood what I was telling her, and I put the phone down, and I started drafting a response to Cassese, saying, thank you, but no thanks. And the telephone rang, and it was President Mandela, who has an endearing habit always of getting through himself, never through a secretary, and there's this unmistakable voice. And he says to me, I understand you've been invited to become the chief prosecutor of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. And I said, yes, and I said, I'm on the point of refusing the invitation. He said, not so fast. He said, I've just spoken to the Secretary General and I told him you'll do it. <laughs> well, well, I said to him, uh, Mr. President, but what about the Constitutional Court that we talked about three days ago? He said, no, no, don't worry about that. The Cabinet met this morning and we've decided to amend the Constitution to make it possible for you to go to The Hague. And for two years, and we'll keep your, your seat on the court will be kept warm for you and will be waiting for you when you get back from, from The Hague. And he said, I think he'd already announced the, the new Chief Justice, uh, the, the head of the Constitutional Court, would be a close friend of mine, Arthur Chaskelson, and uh, he said, uh, he said to speak, speak to Arthur and, 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 and you'll organise the, the details. Anyway, I, I went immediately to speak to, to Arthur Chasterson and, 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 and he said, well, he had a long discussion with, with, with Mandela about it because he said some people felt it was not appropriate for a, for a member of our new highest court, our, our new Supreme Court, uh, to become a prosecutor. And he said, he said, I then discussed with President Mandela that there's a precedent for it, Robert Jackson was a Justice of the United States Supreme Court, and he became the Chief Prosecutor at Nuremberg. And if it was good enough for Robert Jackson to do that, and that was acceptable to the United States Supreme Court, there's no reason why South Africa shouldn't follow 
and follow in his footsteps. And that really was a very relevant and important precedent. I think, but for the Jackson precedent, it may have been different. I may well not have ended up doing what I shouldn't have been doing in the first place, and that's, <laughs> and that's prosecuting. And to, to conclude the story, Louise Arbour was my successor, and she was a justice on the Ontario Supreme Court. And uh, she, she told me that some of her colleagues questioned her becoming a prosecutor, and she said, well, I've got two precedents, it's Robert Jackson and Richard Goldstein. <laughs> Who knew? At this point, I'd like to call up David Crane if he's not. Is, is he still back there? Yes. He is. There he comes. While he's coming up, I, this is probably the last time I'll have a chance publicly to really thank him to for all that he's pulled together over these last few days. And I think we all owe him a large sense of gratitude. And for that, David Crane, thank you. You know, I've noticed, uh, we've done this as our fourth one, as you obviously well know, but I've, I've noticed as longer you all have all stayed here, you are becoming more and more informal. Uh, the ties are coming off, the pants are getting much shorter, uh, people aren't moving with such uh, urgency to the next event. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, uh, I'm beginning to realize that's uh, Chautauqua. So again, uh, this is the spirit of what we want here. That's why we keep it slow, plenty of breaks and stuff. But uh, I don't want to sound to make this sound like a uh, mutual admiration society, but uh, uh, I do want to uh, have Greg Peterson stand up and, and thank him, because this is an individual and his team. Uh, And just to my colleagues and friends, the prosecutors and my good friends in the academy, uh, we're just so happy that you can be here and, and, and enjoy this special place. Uh, you certainly have captured the spirit, but you just make this event so much richer uh, by your intellect, your drive. You honor all of us by being here, and uh, we are internally grateful. Frankly, you are the International Humanitarian Law Dialogue. So, uh, uh, I'm excited that this is uh, the fourth, and hopefully uh, we'll continue this for and in a way that is collegial, friendly, and open, and uh, relaxed. Well, I have the distinct honor of, of introducing a, a good friend, someone who I, be, I knew of, admired, uh, read some of his works, uh, and actually uh, met him briefly uh, when I was at the U.S. Institute of Peace, I had just been appointed chief prosecutor by Kofi Annan. Uh, and about a month later, I went to the U.S. Institute of Peace and outlined my general prosecution strategy for uh, the special court for Sierra Leone, uh, kind of a mission statement and how we were going to accomplish our mandate. And there was a group of uh, NGOs and members from the various governments that were interested, et cetera. But uh, someone who was a fellow, I think, uh, if I have this right, Bill, uh, uh, at the U.S. Institute of Peace was there. And uh, I was introduced to him, and then we shook hands. And uh, I realized uh, that this was the gentleman who had just been asked to be a commissioner on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And at this time, there was a lot of dust in the air. I think comments were being made that the uh, the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Sierra Leone uh, are going to be at war with each other, that they can never, never get along. And uh, I think the then the current or just recently appointed executive director of the TRC, as it was called, said, we're going to build a firewall between the TRC and the Special Court for Sierra Leone. We'll never work with them. And I'm going, wow, this is really setting up a real special relationship. And that's another success story at another time. But I credit a great deal of what eventually became largely a 90% success story between the TRC and the Special Court for Sierra Leone. And I think we bettered that country for it. But I credit uh, now my dear friend, uh, Bill Chavez, who was kind of a lone voice at first, uh, in urging his fellow commissioners to uh, 
just keep an open mind and, and developed a, a way by which we could communicate, which ended up being that I had lunch with the chairman of the uh, Truth Commission monthly and invited the members of the Truth Commission uh, over for a, a dinner uh, quarterly at my quarters just to, just to kind of keep the dialogue open. Now that was the formal part. The thing I find so special about my friend is that we were all by ourselves. Uh, we're re relatively the same age. Uh, uh, our daughters just got married or were marrying within a month of each other. Uh, and so I can remember in the summer of 2003, just after I'd unsealed the indictment against Charles Taylor, and the entire world was mad at me. Uh, my daughter was going to get married uh, about a month after I had done that, and I was leaving for home. Well, Bill came in uh, in his uh, visits to Sierra Leone to do his important duties as a commissioner on the TRC, and we always would meet uh, for dinner or lunch. Usually it was dinner at a special place called the Lighthouse, where we would normally eat grilled barracuda. Uh, and we just look each other in the eye and go, man, we miss our families. And uh, it was just a, to me, it was a, an important uh, reality cornerstone that I always appreciated Bill's commiseration. He was somebody I could speak with openly, honestly. It's kind of lonely at the top, you know. Not many people you can give you a hug when you're the chief prosecutor in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Not that Bill gave me a physical hug, but, but he actually gave me an emotional hug as far as I realized that I'm okay and I'm going to get through this, because uh, those were some pretty dark days, those first uh, 15 months. So uh, I know that I'm building up to uh, a lot, but I, uh, this man is a man of accomplishment, and everybody in this room uh, owes something special to my friend. Uh, I've learned a great deal from him, both just being in Sierra Leone together, but also, just as importantly, uh, just read his books and his articles and his commentary. Uh, he's a leading force in this field of international criminal law. He's the director of the Irish Center for Human Rights uh, at the National University of Ireland in Galway, uh, where he also holds the professorship in human rights law. He's also a professor at the University of Warwick School of Law and professor associate at the University, I'm going to say at the University of Quebec. I'm not a French speaker. Uh, professor Chavez also holds a postgraduate degree in history and in law from the universities in Canada. He's the author of 18 monographs and more than 200 articles dealing with international human rights law and international criminal law. Uh, Bill uh, was a member of the Sierra Leone Truth Commission, as I've said, uh, but this is important. Uh, uh, he is also an officer of the Order of Canada and a member of the Royal Irish Academy and has uh, an LLD honoris causa from Deloyne University in Halifax. Uh, let me introduce my just good friend, our good friend, Bill Chavis. Thanks very much, David, um, for such a nice introduction uh, and uh, for letting me, uh, justifying me showing up here without a, a tie on. I was going to feel that I had to make an apology for doing it, but he justified the informality. Actually, it was a bit intentional because uh, I'm following two predecessors, uh, uh, an international judge and an ambassador who both addressed the role. And now you get the professor, so I have to look like one. And uh, I want to say a word that was not uh, planned, of course, because I didn't expect the remarks from Richard Goldstone, but just to say a, a, a word of appreciation for, for him and a, and a thought about his remarks as well. Um, uh, Greg, when he introduced him, um, I think overlooked, or uh, perhaps because it's such a long list of accomplishments, one of his most recent accomplishments was his, his courageous work chairing the Gaza inquiry for the uh, United Nations and the work he's done since then to defend the work and uphold the integrity of, of that report. And we're all indebted to you. I think it's in the tradition, Richard, of, of Justice Jackson, uh, the remarks we saw yesterday about how the law, international law, applies in an even-handed way and applies to all sides and you're a great symbol of that, of that view, of that philosophy. 
The other thing I find interesting in the way Richard Goldstone describes the story of how he became the prosecutor, um, I don't think it was obvious to people in 1994 or early 1995, 94 rather, early 1994, that the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia was going to be the start of something big. Um, that all seems clear to us now, and we teach the story of the international uh, tribunals. It began in 93. Weren't people like Richard Goldstone lucky to get in right at the beginning? But I think a lot of people in 1993 and 1994 looked at it as a, a career-ending move, a dead end, a potential flop. Uh, and it took, I think, uh, some kind of um, inspired genius, I suppose, to, to see this happening and to realize that at a decisive moment, Richard had been appointed to the highest, as he said, the highest office in the, at, the, at a crucial time in the history of his own country, and to take on this job that I think others would have walked away from or backed away from or found a way to, to avoid because of questions about whether it was going to be a waste of time and a failure, which, which many people did say. I can remember this at, at the time. And I think that may have been uh, the situation with Robert Jackson in 1945 as well. He was criticized by his colleagues. We know the famous quote from, I think, the Chief Justice talking about Nuremberg being a high-grade lynching party or something like this. And uh, the fact that these two men at different times in history, um, but again, both at, at the highest office in their country and at crucial stages in, in their career, decided to devote their time and their energy and their skills to international justice is uh, at a time when it wasn't obvious, when the success of it was not obvious, is a remarkable um, thing. And uh, we honor Robert Jackson, but we also have to honor Richard Goldstone and understand that, that wonderful quality of his. Last uh, night, I was reminded as Don Ferenz walked down the staircase with his bagpipes of the uh, of the final uh, moments of the conference in Kampala in June. And we were there uh, together at the conference. We often sat in the evenings and had a drink together and chatted. And when the, when the decision was taken, when the amendment was adopted early in the morning on the 12th, it was, some, I think, about half past 12, uh, midnight, early in the morning on the 12th of June, uh, Don pulled out his bagpipes and piped the uh, victory and everybody applauded and cheered as we did last night. But as I recall, Don was a bit, he was, he was debating whether, whether it really was an occasion for bagpipes and uh, his dad, who was, I think you were sitting right next to me, Ben, um, was also um, debating whether this was really, whether we'd accomplished something or whether this was actually a, a moment of great disappointment that didn't deserve commemoration. Um, I sensed a bit of that also in, in Ben's comments yesterday uh, in the session when he, he went through what, what have we accomplished. And I, I, was, I felt a bit disappointed because I think that, um, I think it is a great accomplishment and that's what my remarks are going to try and develop for you, the adoption of the amendments on aggression. And it saddens me that a man probably more than any other individual who's so responsible for that great accomplishment um, still feels ambivalent about, the, about, about what we've done. Ben, I'm going to try and convince you in the next 15 or 20 minutes as to why this is such an important uh, development. Uh, for those, it, and it has been explained, I think, in the different lectures and in the different sessions that this is a very complex amendment, but I think it can actually be explained somewhat simply what happened uh, at the conference in Kampala. There was a placeholder in the statute of the International Criminal Court allowing for amendments that would enable the court to prosecute the crime of aggression. But there was not obvious agreement on how that would work, and that's why only a placeholder was left there when the Rome Statute was adopted in 1998. And we spent 12 years struggling with the various issues, some of which we were aware of in 1998 and some of which we only discovered as the process went along, trying to figure out, trying to craft um, alternatives and, and provisions, language that could be adopted and would go in the statute and that would enable this to work. And it was not obvious at any point 
that this was going to succeed. Uh, it was not obvious even at the conference. It was not obvious until the final minutes of the conference that this was going to succeed. I remember that morning coming back from the pool at the hotel and bumping into Bill Pace, who's sitting over there, and, and Bill, what's going to happen? He said, they haven't got the votes. They haven't got the votes. And he shrugged his shoulders as if it was a, as if it was a dead duck. And we were all surprised, of course, and we waited with great anticipation during, during the, the day um, until these were adopted in the, well, in the final minutes of the conference uh, by consensus, because nobody called for a vote. And Bill Pace was right. If someone had called for a vote, there probably were not enough votes even for the minimum required uh, to get to the, uh, to, to, for, to secure the amendment's adoption. So what it does is it adds an article to the statute that defines the crime of aggression, and it's not as broad and generous as some would have liked, but it's something that works and that's acceptable and it's a beginning. And above all, it does the job of saying there is a crime of aggression and we have words that can set out the limits of it. And there will be no doubt if it's ever prosecuted judicial interpretation that will give some clarity to it. And like most of the crimes that have been applied by international criminal tribunals, um, it will not be immune to judicial interpretation um, and uh, probably the expansion of the definition. Um, at any rate, a liberal approach to its application. So it's too early to tell how that will work out. And as I say, it may never be prosecuted, which would not necessarily be a bad thing. It would just show that it, it confirms the deterrent effect of the prohibition of the crime of aggression as defined in the statute. Then we have two other articles that set out how the crime is to be, uh, how the prosecution is to be authorized by the court. And the first of them, it's actually the second in the order of the statute, but it's the first in the priority is that the Security Council will always be able to assign the court prosecution for a crime of aggression, um, no matter where it takes place in the world. And then the, the second provision allows for, the, uh, for a state that has joined the court, or for the prosecutor acting on the prosecutor's own initiative, to begin a prosecution when the Security Council doesn't, doesn't proceed. And those were the, 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 that part of it was much more controversial. Um, and that part of it only applies, of course, to the states that have joined the court uh, and to those that have not uh, opted out of jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. And then we have also some complicated rules about how all of this is to enter into force. Because it's not immediately enforced. It's adopted, but it still has to be brought into force. But I think, and, and Ben went through the list yesterday of the, the difficulties we have along the, the path, but I don't think they're actually going to be very difficult. The first requirement is we have to get 30 of the 113 states, approximately a quarter of them, to ratify the amendment. Uh, Judge Cole yes, uh, yesterday explained that Germany's already working on this, and I suspect many other countries were. I think we'll probably get to 30 within two or three years. That won't be hard at all. And then we have to have a resolution adopted by the states, the 113 of them. It has to be a two-thirds vote. I think that'll be easy. That'll be straightforward. So I don't think these are, these are difficult obstacles. They're not anywhere near as difficult as the obstacle appeared in 1998 when we adopted the Rome Statute of getting to 60 ratifications. And people in 1998 thought that was insurmountable. I remember friends at Amnesty International arguing that the 60 figure was a, an American plot to make sure that the statute would never, be, would never enter into force because we'd never get to 60. Of course, we got to 60 in three years and eight months, and now we're at almost double that amount. So I don't see much difficulty with getting to that point. And then the third issue is that it's possible for states to make a declaration by which they, they reject the jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. And I don't think that that's going to be a, a commonly used provision at all, because that's a political declaration that governments will have to make. And I think that the lawyers in the foreign ministries will go to their ministers and say, what do you think? How would you like to do this? And the minister will say, you want me to make a declaration saying that we want to be sheltered from jurisdiction of an international court over aggression? 
I don't think I want to do that politically. I'll be roasted in the newspapers, I'll be criticized by civil society, and maybe I'll pay for it in an election. So I don't think, I mean, I could be wrong, we don't know what the future holds. I don't think this is going to be very important at all. So I think what we're likely to have within six years and four months and maybe a few days of today is a court with jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, capable of prosecuting the crime um, if it's committed on the territory and by the citizens of members of 113 states in the world or close to that. And that's not bad. That's a pretty good accomplishment and very significant and a lot better, I think, than what most people expected uh, in early June of this year that we would get. Um, there's also another little part of it that I think is interesting, and this is the, the incentive it creates to states to join, to, to join the court, the ones that aren't in it, to join the court with the amendment, because it will protect them. It provides them an added layer of protection against aggression. You know, most states, and, and it is a bit special talking here in the United States with the biggest army in the world and the strongest military and troops all over the world, but, you know, I live in Ireland. Our soldiers stay home. They don't go anywhere. We call them the defense force. That's all they do. And all we're worried about, we're not terribly worried in Ireland, but if we had a worry, it would just be about some being victims of aggression. And we're not worried about being prosecuted for it. And I think there's an added incentive now in the, the structure of the, these amendments that may encourage some states to join the court, precisely because it will add, add a layer of protection to them against the crime of aggression. So I think all of this is very important um, and, and very likely to succeed and an important accomplishment, as I say, even if it's never prosecuted, even if this crime is never prosecuted, because of what it says about law and the message that it puts out. Now, we've been told since the, yesterday, even the evening before when we were at the Jackson Center, we've been reminded of these important statements by Robert Jackson and by the judges at Nuremberg and by prosecutors at Nuremberg about the link between war and other crimes. That war is the supreme international crime. These were the words in the Nuremberg judgment. Judge Cowell, in his wonderful speech yesterday, used a, an intriguing metaphor where he talked about the other crimes being the excrement of the war. But the, but the message was that the war is the center of it. The war is the horror that's responsible for this, for these other violations. And to the extent that the adoption of this amendment revives that vision of international atrocities, I think this is a very good development. I think it would have been, by the way, a very negative development in terms of that message if we had not adopted the amendment. That too, that would have done harm to the idea that war is the supreme international crime. Uh, there's another aspect of it that I, I like that I think is very positive, is that it renews the focus with international criminal law on the role of the state, on the role of governments. Um, this is a crime that applies only to governments and only to high officials, leaders in governments. There's a debate that's been going on and uh, about, about the role of the state and the role of governments in international crimes, whether it's an, an element of international crimes, whether it's a central feature of them. Again, Judge Kyle wrote a, a marvelous dissenting opinion, but the dissents of today are likely to be the majorities of tomorrow, a dissenting opinion about the nature of crimes against humanity with regard to the Kenya situation that I think also in its own way, and it, it also has a wonderful historical perspective on international crimes that, 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 that brings it together with this talk about war being the supreme international crime and that it's about the state being responsible for these crimes um, that, is the, that should be the focus of our attention. And, so again, to the extent that the adoption of the amendment on aggression brings that back, I think that's a very positive development as well. Well, really, we've said that because we haven't been able to prosecute aggression for the last 60 years, that this has caused us great harm, caused great harm to the world. I'm not sure that that's an, an accurate characterization of the situation. 
it's true that we have had difficulty um, bringing aggression into the mainstream of international criminal prosecution, something that was done at Nuremberg, but that has, to a certain extent, been lost over the years as we focused on the other categories, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. When the Yugoslavia tribunal was set up, aggression was put to the side. It wasn't, it wasn't dealt with, and we dealt with the other categories of crimes. But uh, people should recall, it's not well known, but that earlier in the process of reviving international criminal justice, at the beginning of the 1990s, there was a proposal to set up an ad hoc tribunal. It was never created, but an ad hoc tribunal for um, Kuwait, or for Iraq, to deal with Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait in 1990. And that proposal called for prosecuting Saddam Hussein for the crime of aggression. And that proposal came from President Bush and Prime Minister Thatcher, and it was later picked up within the European uh, Union and the European communities. It didn't go anywhere, but it's actually a, an important uh, step in the story of reviving international criminal justice that led to the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. But our modern focus on these other crimes, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide, which we might call the, the human rights crimes. These are, these are about human rights violations and criminalizing human rights violations, stands kind of in distinction to aggression, which is a different kind of a crime, in a sense. And I want to understand why that's the case. I think that part of the explanation is that in international law, we have dealt with the crime of aggression since 1945, not through international criminal law, but through the law of the United Nations, of the Charter of the United Nations. Human rights violations, we didn't deal with as well through the United Nations, actually, because the Charter of the United Nations, while it prohibited the use of force to settle international disputes, in Article 2, Paragraph 4, left a big hole through Article 2, Paragraph 7, whereby it acknowledged the fact that states were entitled to do what they wanted within their own borders. And that's why the prosecution of the human rights crimes has seemed so important to us, because that problem wasn't being addressed by international law in an adequate manner. Whereas the crime of aggression, or the act of aggression, was, to, was being dealt with I think in a, in a fairly effective way through the law of the United Nations over the years. It hasn't been as urgent to criminalize it for that reason. Now, we have not had a world war since 1945. We saw the terrible pictures of Berlin yesterday at lunch and how that, that wonderful city, again a wonderful city, was destroyed and devastated by the war. Maybe they deserved it. There were lots of other cities that were destroyed in different parts of the world and in the victim countries as well by the war. But that terrible destruction has never been revisited uh, on the world in terms of a world war. In a sense, we've solved that problem. Maybe not forever, but we've addressed it within the framework of the United Nations and we've lived through one of the longest periods of peace in terms of international conflict. There have been a few, I don't deny it. But there's been no world war. There's been nothing comparable. Hans Peter yesterday reminded us of 20 million Soviet citizens dead in the space of four years. And there's nothing equivalent to that since 1945. It's often said that the 20th century was the bloodiest century of all time. And I'm sure that's true. But it's actually the first half of the 20th century that's the bloodiest part of it. People do point, and I'm sure that if I don't say this, somebody's going to raise their hand and say, yes, but there have been terrible civil wars, and of course that's true. And that's, what, that's the bread and butter of our international criminal tribunals now, are the civil wars. And it's probably a flaw still in, our, in, 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 ter in terms of making a holistic international criminal law system that we don't yet have a mechanism to deal with the, the concept of aggression or of unlawful war when it's a civil war. If we say, if we, and I accept this, that war is the supreme evil, that war is the cause of this, then how do we deal with war in a civil, in a civil war within borders? And, and our amendments on aggression will deal with war when it takes place internationally, but won't enable us to address this other issue. And I'm not sure 
how to do that. I don't have a concrete proposal, but, but I think that perhaps putting the crime of aggression at the center again of the agenda of the ICC gives us an opportunity to start to reflect again on how we might, uh, how we might address this. Being, a, being a, 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 an academic, of course, I'm, I'm always intrigued of going back and looking at old documents and fascinated again by this period, uh, this seminal period in history in terms of the development of this body of law, which was 19, basically 1944 to 1948 or 49. So much happened and so much developed and so much of our understanding and so much wisdom the wisdom of Jackson and others who said that war is the supreme evil and the message that has been somewhat blurred uh, over, the de over the decades and that, that we now return to. At one of the earliest conferences we had in, within the framework of the International Criminal Court on the crime of aggression, it was organized by Judge Poditi, Mauro Poditi, now retired. Um, and it was held at his, his old university in Italy. And I was asked to prepare a paper studying the, the origins of the crime of aggression and the adoption of the, the crime against peace in the law of Nuremberg. And I went through the, the documents of a body called the United Nations War Crimes Commission that met during the 1944 and that paved the way for the London Conference, the conference that was at which Jackson played the central role and where the, the, the charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal was adopted. And when they first started to meet in 1944 to organize the prosecutions, they actually had no intention, from what I can determine, of prosecuting the crime of aggression or crimes against peace. The body was called the United Nations War Crimes Commission, and that's how it started in early 44. And within a year, they were talking about not just war crimes, but crimes against peace and crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity is another subject. It's another lecture. But crimes against peace, how did that come from? And where did that come from? And as I studied it and studied these papers, I, I began to think of it almost as an expedient that the judges had adopted. It, it, I was puzzled by this because they were not the judges, but the negotiators. What they were searching for was a kind of a paradigm, a, a, a theoretical construct by which they could encapsulate all of the criminality of the Nazi regime. They were given a body of law, war crimes law, that applied to a submarine commander or a, or a concentration camp guard or, a, or the head of a, but, but the individual crimes, and they didn't really have a theoretical model to join up the dots to Hitler and to Goering and to Ribbentrop and the rest of them. And so the theory emerged within these negotiations that actually it wasn't about war crimes, but it was about the crime against peace, crimes against peace, and that, that it was the conspiracy to commit crimes against peace that, that was the glue that brought them together and enabled a trial of 23 or 24. They were originally, originally 24 were indicted, 22 were sought through till the end of the trial of the International Military Tribunal. But that was, the, that, was, that was the vision. I was a bit, I think, uh, too cynical when I gave the lecture some years ago. We often occasionally regret or readjust our thinking on something. And I'm inclined now to be more positive about it and to see this not as an expedient, but rather, a, rather an understanding that war was, in fact, the root of the, the evil. It's also true, and I should just say uh, in parentheses, that we do have examples of conflicts and of atrocities that take place in the absence of war. Um, that does happen, and we've struggled very much with developing international law so as to, to cover that. But I think when we add up all of the atrocities and we look at all the conflicts, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, war isn't far away. It's almost, all, almost always there, not entirely. Well, let me have a couple more minutes, a few ideas about perhaps why this, historically, this focus on aggression has become blurred and why it, why it was difficult to get to, the, to get to the result we got to on the 12th of June, 2010. I think one of the factors is that we have become a bit more militarized than we should be in terms of thinking of solutions to human rights problems. There was a bit of this, I'm sorry he's not here to, 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 to hear my reflections on his own comments, but Steve Rapp yesterday emphasized the importance of the use of force to prevent atrocities. And 
I don't exclude the possibility that there are very, very special occasions when force is perhaps useful and necessary in order to prevent human rights violations, but nor would I exaggerate the importance of that, because war brings with it all of the horror, inevitably. And solving a problem, a human rights problem, with the use of force is more likely to be a case of, of killing the patient to cure the illness, I think. Um, we have an example of it uh, recently with the intervention in, in Iraq. Well, originally, as you know, it was justified on a, on, a, on a pretext of the weapons of mass destruction story, which we now know more and more was, was really nothing more than a fraud of cooked intelligence data that was being prepared by political masters who, who had an agenda, which was to use force in Iraq, regardless of the cause. And then when that pretext evaporated, the focus then became on human rights, saving human rights. But I think it would be, in terms of a cost-benefit analysis, the benefits to Iraq of the last seven years of misery brought on by the presence of armed conflict, tanks, aircraft, soldiers, and everything, uh, versus the illness that was allegedly being corrected, it doesn't add up, actually. And that should just remind us that these that, that the use of force to solve human rights problems, again, uh, I won't exclude the possibility, but as a general rule, it does a lot more harm than good, and we should remind, be reminded that that's what happens when you use force. It is the evil that we have to deal with. So I think that some of that has infected our vision of this. Uh, we've spoken about the attitude of certain organizations at the Rome Conference to the Amendment on Aggression. Human Rights Watch, the great non-governmental organization, in its uh, explanation of why it was not going to engage with the crime of aggression, specifically referred to what we call humanitarian intervention. We do, Human Rights Watch said, sometimes advocate, advocate the use of force in order to deal with violations of, of human rights. And so there is a, I think that's a piece of the explanation of, of why we had the difficulty getting to this point. Uh, the second part of it, another, another piece of this puzzle, and um, John uh, and uh, Bill Pace spoke about this uh, yesterday in their remarks. I, I want to, by the way, pay tribute to both of them for the wonderful work they've done for many, many years in terms of building the International Criminal Court. I, I wished I was waiting for someone to ask one of them a question yesterday. Uh, can you put aside the views of your coalition and just tell us what you think personally? Uh, because I always sensed that, that, that Bill Pace certainly was more, was, was probably more closer to the, uh, to the side of wanting to address aggression properly in the International Criminal Court than the organization that he represents. But I won't put words in his mouth. I'll let Bill speak for himself when he chooses the, the right time to do that. Um, but they said when they were explaining it that, the, that their coalition had many, many civil society organizations that did not see the importance of the crime of aggression because they had their own issues, specific issues or organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, I suppose, that have a broader, uh, a broad agenda. And Michael Scharf then in, intervened with a, with a wonderful question, but I think one that went unanswered. He, he, he referred to Hans Peter's metaphor of, the, of, of, the, uh, of human rights violations being the excrement of war, and said, don't they understand that? And uh, as I say, I don't think it was properly addressed, but let me say it again. Or, or let's say, they should understand that. They should understand that, that if war is the supreme evil, uh, and you want to prevent human rights violations, whether they're a specific category, violence against women, against children, or whether it's an agenda, an, a, a human rights organization with a, a broad vision in terms of the areas it addresses, they should understand that if you want to protect human rights and prevent abuses against vulnerable populations, you have to want to prevent war. That's central to it, and it has to find its place within the human rights discourse. Amnesty International would be the NGO that's probably tried to articulate this in the, in the clearest way, saying that uh, they don't engage with the issue of aggression because they take their mandate from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
I say the Universal Declaration of Human Rights doesn't, doesn't answer this, doesn't deal with this. And uh, I beg to differ. Uh, I, I beg to differ. Read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The word peace appears in the very first sentence of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's implicit in other provisions. And Ferenc reminded us in his speech about Article 3, the right to life. And the right to life, it doesn't refer specifically to war as a cause of violations of the right to life, but it doesn't exclude it either. And there are other provisions where this is implied. There's the reference in the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was put in by Eleanor Roosevelt, and they're the immortal words of her husband, freedom from fear. The four freedoms are in the preamble, they're referred to. And when you say freedom from fear, aren't you speaking about this issue? Isn't that part of it? And finally, there's Article 28 at the very end of the Universal Declaration that talks about the human right to live in a world order where your human rights can be protected. And it's that understanding that we need peace in order to protect human rights. And so I think it's, it's, a, it's a, mis, a misunderstanding of human rights law, although one that I think is still rather widespread, about the importance of peace to human rights, the danger that war, whatever its cause, even sometimes, even sometimes so-called noble cause, uh, is, is, is threatening to human rights. And that the fact that this amendment maybe helps to reposition this debate and move this vision of human rights um, back to the center is welcome and is helpful. It doesn't solve everything, but it's a, it's a positive uh, contribution. Um, let me just conclude with a thought about why this amendment is good for the court in terms of the health of the institution. Uh, because the fact that we could adopt this amendment after all these difficulties, that we could have such clarity that we could get to a good, useful, productive result is a sign of a healthy institution. Uh, and I think that the International Criminal Court, if we look at it over the last seven or eight years, has actually been an institution that's been struggling. And so we're looking for signs of health. It's important, it's encouraging, it's significant to see them. I recently went back and read some of the documents of the the, the, these are the administrative documents of the court, of the body called the Assembly of States Parties. Boring things. Nobody ever reads, like the budget of the court. And the budget, you may know, is proposed by the, by the organs of the court, um, and then it's adopted by the Assembly of States Parties, which is the, made up of the, the countries that belong to the court. And I looked at the proposed budget in 2004, the prosecutor had a proposal that he needed so much money because he was going to finish his first trial by August of 2005 and be well advanced on his second trial by the end of 2005. Well, of course, that didn't happen. Um, then in 2006, the prosecutor issued a three-year plan, a work plan, and there it was, it was explained that the goal was to complete two trials within the next three years, that is, by 2009. Well, that wasn't accomplished either. The first trial, still unfinished, only began in 2009, and it won't be finished probably until sometime next year in 2011. Now, I'm not saying this to, I'm, I'm not saying this to, be, to be critical. Uh, I'm really just saying to, to state or to demonstrate how our expectations have not been fulfilled about the court. I, I say our. I'm talking about the prosecutor's expectations. The prosecutor expected to be much further advanced in the work uh, when he made these first proposals in 2004 than he is today. And there may be many explanations for this, uh, and I don't propose to, so I'm going to finish in a minute, I don't propose to go into any of that, but simply to say that when, when the expectations have not been fulfilled and when there's disappointment in many quarters about how the institution is performing, it's very, very important to have signs of health, and that's what Kampala does for us. Um, others have spoken about the activities that took place in the in the first week, the uh, the stock taking exercises. And while that may have been positive and helpful, I wouldn't think that's the main act. Again, the ambiguity of this. I saw the brochure of the Coalition of the International Criminal Court, and it has as the the headline: "The civil society welcomes." 
I forget the wording, but the focus is on the stop taking. Civil society should welcome the amendment on aggression. That's the big piece. That's the big success story of Kampala, and it's the big victory. And it shows that we have a court that is still relevant and valid and that is, is moving, moving forward. And that's a very helpful, positive, constructive message for all of us. And that we could accomplish this, despite all odds, um, is a tribute a tribute to some of the key negotiators. Some of you know them. I won't mention their names because they'll be unfamiliar to many of the people in the room. But above all, it's a tribute to the, the determination uh, and the dedication of the man who's sitting right in front of me, looking me in the eye, Ben Ferenc. Thank you very much. The Jackson Center is a historical and educational facility dedicated to preserving the legacy of this country lawyer who became Solicitor General, Attorney General, a Justice of the Supreme Court, and served as Chief Prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials of Nazi war criminals following World War II. To learn more about this program, Robert Jackson, the Jackson Center, and upcoming events, the Jackson Center is located at 305 East 4th Street, Jamestown, New York, and found on the web at www.roberthjackson.org or contacted by telephoning 716-483-6646.